Philippians chapter number 3. Like I said, I was going to take a, a week off like I normally do with our Bible school. I normally preach a message along with our uh, Bible school. But I, I'm hoping that most of you in here know what John 3.16 means. Amen? I'm hoping you know the importance of that. And so I want to continue right along with our a study in the book of Philippians. And as we move into Philippians chapter 3, uh, Paul is continuing his encouragement um, to the Philippians. Uh, in fact, he begins uh, there in verse 1. He says, Finally, brothers, rejoice in the Lord. Uh, to write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. And so uh, he's continuing that. He says, look. He says, rejoice in the Lord. Uh, you, you know, sing God's praises. Be excited about serving the Lord. He said, this is not hard for me to write to you, and, and it, it's safe. I don't know what was so safe about it and why it wouldn't be safe, uh, but we have it here. But notice he moves immediately, and maybe that's why he said this is safe for me, because he moves immediately in verse number 2 uh, into a warning. He says, look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who um, mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision <coughs> who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Throughout Paul's ministry and sharing the gospel message, he was forced to contend with a group today that we call the Judaizers, but these were, and I'll use quotes, they considered themselves Christians. Uh, and the reason I use quotes there, because rid, uh, actually they were false teachers. What they tried to do is they tried to teach and tried to place these new Gentile converts, these new Gentile Christians, they tried to place them under the act of the law. Okay, saying, okay, you need to keep all of the law of Moses or you can't be a Christian. And even more than that, they said, you need to be circumcised or you cannot be a Christian. In other words, uh, it wasn't just by faith, uh, by the grace of God, they were adding works to this salvation. And so uh, anybody that adds works to salvation, I'm going to tell you right now, they're a false teacher. I'm not saying some of the things they're teaching aren't right, but I'm telling you that the main basis of what they're teaching is wrong. Because we cannot work our way to heaven. And so Paul finds it necessary here to warn the Philippians about these false teachers. And it's interesting, he uses a play on words here. He calls these Judaizers, he calls them uh, katome, which means mutilation. Uh, the King James translates it uh, concision, uh, and the ESV translated those who mutilate the flesh. In other words, he's saying uh, those, you're, you're taking that which is supposed to be holy, and you're using it to do something it was never intended to do. Okay? Uh, circumcision was something that was God created for His people, the chosen people of Israel, to show that they were His people. Okay? We don't need that anymore to show that we're His people. We put our faith in Jesus Christ, not in any type of works. Okay? And so he's playing on that word because he then calls the true Christians paratomy, which means circumcision. Uh, and so uh, one of the, what he's doing, he's taking that which their teaching is necessary for these people to be saved, and he's using that. He says, let me tell you something. The true circumcised, those who are truly circumcised, he's not talking about the physical action of circumcision, he's talking about the circumcision of the heart. He says those who are truly circumcised are those who worship by the Spirit of God. Those who glory in Christ. Those who put no confidence in the flesh. In other words, we're not putting confidence in the work that we do. We're not putting in the confidence in the things that, that we accomplish. We're putting in the confidence on things that He has accomplished. And so Paul uses this, and he then uses himself as an example to those who truly are righteous and have put their righteousness through the faith in Jesus Christ. Okay? Uh, and if you don't get anything else, I'm looking around, everybody's still awake at this point, so I'm going to tell you this right off the bat, because if you don't want to get anything else, I want you to get this. True righteousness is found only in Jesus Christ. You will not do it. You cannot accomplish it apart from Jesus Christ. And so Paul tells them how to do this. Number one, we need to renounce the flesh. 
And, and Paul begins by telling a little bit of his culture here in verse 4. He says, Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also, if anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. A circumcised on the eighth day uh, of, the, of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. And so he comes and says, if, if anybody had the right to brag, it's Paul. Now, I want you to understand that's not what Paul's doing. Just the opposite. Okay, Paul said if anybody had, had reason to put confidence in self, if anybody had reason to put confidence in flesh, if anybody could say, hey, I can do it myself and I can get myself to heaven, it would have been the Apostle Paul. And Paul says, but I can't do that. Okay, uh, and then he begins to list, okay, this is why if there was anybody that could do it, I could do it. He says that he was circumcised on the eighth day. Now, if you know Jewish culture, that means that he followed Jewish custom. Jewish custom was to have the child, the Jewish child, circumcised on the eighth day. And so Paul said, he said, look, I was born Jew. I, I'm not a proselyte. In other words, I wasn't saved later in life. I wasn't converted later in life to become a Jew. Paul says, when I was born, I was a Jew. You want a true Jew? Paul says, that's me. I'm there. And he says, it's proven by the fact that on the eighth day I was circumcised. I was in that covenant. And then he, then he says that he was of the people, he says, of Israel. In other words, he's saying, I am a descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, if you'll remember, and you've been joining us, Sam went through this, it's been a good little while back, though, when we went into Genesis. If you'll remember, there was a covenant made with God's people. It was originally made with Abraham, and God said, your descendants will be more than anyone can count. At one time, it were compared to stars. At one time, it was compared to the sand on the beach. Uh, it, more than anyone can count, those are your descendants. And that covenant was passed down from Abraham, then to Isaac, then to Jacob. And Paul says, I'm part of that covenant. I'm in that family. I go back to that covenant because he is a child of Abraham. Now, by the way, how many children of Abraham do we have here today? Just one. Good, okay. Two, three. Any others? Do I need to bring the kids back in here to lead y'all in Father Abraham? You know, Father Abraham had many sons, and many sons had Father Abraham, and I am one of them, and so were you, so let's just praise the Lord. Do I need to bring them back in here? Y'all y'all got that? See, that's the problem. Y'all done left all these nice little kid songs along. Y'all done forgot the gospel. Now, if you're saved this morning, raise your hand again if you're a child of Abraham. Thank you. Now, listen to me. None of you were born into the family. I don't think. I don't think I have any Jews here. I might. You weren't born into the family. You were adopted into the family through the blood of Jesus Christ. Paul said, I'm not adopted into the family. I was born into the family. I'm one of God's people. He says he is of the tribe of Benjamin. Now this was a distinguished tribe because they had the first king of Israel came from this tribe. That first king was who? Uh, stop, Sam. It was a trick question. He helped y'all out. I was waiting for him to say David. You know, David is uh, uh, the other tribe of Judah. But Saul, the first king, remember? Oh, uh, if you've been with us on Wednesday night, you know this, okay? Now the people said, we want a king just like everybody else has. They were being led by judges. <coughs> and he said, we want a king. And said, give us a king. And that first king that they got, they picked. They picked Saul. And so Saul was their first king. <coughs> he was of the tribe here of Benjamin. Uh, this also was a tribe that aligned itself with Judah. If you know your Bible history, at one point the people of Israel split into two nations. And this tribe, this tribe of Benjamin, stayed with the tribe of Judah. It was the tribe where the city of Jerusalem was located. 
So this was the, uh, the prestigious tribe of the people was this tribe. And then he says, a Hebrew of Hebrews. This meant that he was not some Jew that embraced the Greek culture. Many in that day, they tried to live as much like the Greeks as they could. They were Jewish, but they tried to live as much like the Greeks as they could because they liked the benefits that the Greeks were getting. They liked the benefits that the Romans were getting. And so they lived as much like them as they could so they could get those benefits, but still say they were Jewish. That reminds me of the Christian church today. How about you? Many Christians today, they want to be Christians, they want to be children of God, but they want to live as much like the world as they can. They want all the benefits of the world. They want everything the world has to offer them, but when all said and done and this is over, they want a home in heaven. <laughs> Paul says, I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. I was raised Hebrews. I was raised Hebrew. My parents brought me up as a Hebrew. Paul says, I am a Hebrew. In fact, we really don't find out much about Paul being part of the Romans uh, until he gets arrested and they violate his rights. But he said, I was born as a Hebrew. He then moves into three things that were his by personal conviction or choice. That's his culture. That's, how, that's who he was. Okay? He can't change that. Listen to me. Some of y'all sitting around family, you can't change that. Your family is your family, amen? Sometimes we wish we could change it. You know, uh, you know how I know? Because you're getting ready to go to a, to a family function, you've got a friend with you, and you tell that friend, you say, okay, uh, you, you're just going to have to ignore, I'm trying to find a name that ain't in here, uh, you, you're just going to have to ignore Brother Bill, or you just have to ignore, ignore my Uncle Bill, ignore him, okay? Just, just, just ignore him, the rest of the family does, just ignore him. What are we saying? Oh, Uncle Bill's part of the family, but we wish he wasn't. <laughs> All this stuff that Paul set up to this, that's his cult, that's who he is. He cannot deny that. That is him. Now, this next list of things that he says, these are things that he chose. These are his by conviction. This is who he chose to be. If you look down, continuing in verse number five, he says, As to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. So he says, as, a, as of the law, he says, I'm a Pharisee. And again, if you know your Bible, the Pharisee, they were the elite of the elite sect of the Jews. They held themselves up here. Uh, they were devoted to the Scriptures. Uh, in fact, their name means separated ones. They would separate themselves from common life, from common tasks, in order that they might live their lives to keep every little detail of the law. They, they were the ones that wanted every little detail kept, not only of the law, as we've discussed in here before, uh, they even added a few things to the law. <laughs> you know, they were the ones that, that, that questioned Jesus about His disciples eating with those that were unclean. Uh, they were the ones that, that questioned Jesus. They, they had the big problem with Jesus because Jesus didn't come and live everything to the minute letter of the law. But Paul says, that's who I was. He thought I was a very religious man. He said, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church. A Paul actively fought against those whom he saw as heretics against Judaism. Uh, he, <clears throat> we know now that that was done out of ignorance, but there's no denying the zeal that he had. I mean, up until the day on the road to Damascus, uh, he persecuted Christians. He would, had letters on the way to Damascus to go and arrest Christians. We know that whether he killed them or not, we do not know. But we do know that he sanctioned the killing of Christians. If you'll remember, he stood by holding the coats when Stephen was stoned to death. Paul was, they didn't believe what he believed. They thought that, 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 that this new Christian group, that this new uh, uh, folks that are following Jesus, he thought they had stepped out of line of where they ought to be with God. And Paul had a zeal. He went 
after them with tenacity. He wanted them arrested. He wanted them stopped. Again, Paul would find out, and we know now that was done out of ignorance, but it was still the amount of zeal. And that's what Paul said. Of zeal, I had it. He said, I was persecuting the church. Now remember, he's discussing, he's comparing himself to these Judaizers. So he's saying, if anybody was there, he said, I was there. And as to righteousness under the law, Paul says, I was blameless. Paul had achieved the standard of righteousness that was accepted among the men of that day. We know, and Paul would find out, that all of his righteousness fell short of the glory of God. But according to man, he was there. By the way the law was taught in the day that Paul was there, they were deceived into thinking they could really be blameless. They were deceived into thinking if they kept all of these things and did all of these things, that their life would be blameless. We see that in the story of the rich young ruler. Uh, if you'll remember in Luke chapter 18, Jesus comes to him and he says, what, what do I do? He said, I, I'm doing everything I can do to have this relationship. He said, what do I lack? And Jesus says, keep the commandments. And that young Jewish ruler says, uh, I've done that since my birth. Now look at me. How many know that that man did not keep the Ten Commandments since his birth? No way he did. Okay? But according to the way they taught, because he had done all these little checklist things, he considered himself blameless. In fact, as you know, he walked away from Jesus because he didn't think Jesus had nothing to offer him. Because he had already done everything. Paul says, that was me. So we've looked at his culture, we've looked at his conviction, which brings Paul to his conclusion here in verse 7 and 8. He says, but whatever gain I had, I count as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ my Lord. For His sake I have suffered the loss of all these things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. As Paul looks back on all of this, he looks on his culture, he looks on his conviction, looks on everything that he has done up until that day. He concludes that everything that he's looking at, he said, I don't count that as gain. He said, it's actually loss. Now, by the way, those teachers of Paul's day, if they could look at a guy like Paul, they'd say, yeah, that's the guy I want. I mean, they'd be proud of Paul. And Paul says, no. Paul says, I haven't gained anything. Paul says, actually, it's all loss. It's interesting, the word gain here is plural in the Greek, and the word loss is singular. In other words, Paul said everything, all of it combined, is loss, period, gone. Doesn't benefit anything. Notice, too, he has a one, he's the one who counted it but lost. Before becoming a Christian, he thought all of these things made him a success. He was trying to please God by His works. Church, no amount of work we do can buy God's favor. It wasn't just His religious history that He counted as loss. He counted everything as loss. And this conclusion was drawn as He looked at the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ. Paul says, I compare all of that stuff with now knowing Jesus Christ, Paul said, none of that matters. Everything I've been looking for, everything that I've been wanting, he says, it's right here. That knowledge of Jesus Christ, that relationship with Jesus Christ, everything else is just a waste. Which brings us to his rejoicing. 
Again, there at the end of verse number 8, we see his devotion. Let me read it to you again. He says, For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. Paul gave it all up for the gain of Christ. How many people through the years have we seen do exactly the opposite? They've sacrificed their relationship with Jesus because they want to be somebody. They want to gain some temporary possession or some temporary position. They sacrifice their church time because they want to go live life. One day they're going to regret that, amen? Now look, I'm not saying you can't have a relationship with Jesus Christ without being in the church, but I am telling you there's a reason that Jesus said that we ought to come together. Wouldn't have told us that if he didn't believe it, amen? They sacrifice their service to Jesus to serve self. God's given them all kinds of gifts, all kinds of abilities, all kinds of talent, but instead of using them for Jesus Christ, they'd rather serve self. It takes too much time to serve the church. It takes too much time to serve Jesus. I'm just going to go out here. I I need my time. I'm going to serve self. I'm going to do what I want to do. They sacrifice their stewardship to keep up with the Joneses. We, we, we can't give to the Lord's work because we got all these other things we need. Look at all this stuff we need. And they sacrifice, listen to me here, they sacrifice their kids' relationship with Jesus because they found no time for a relationship with Jesus themselves. I believe that that's what people are going to be haunted by the most in eternity. Not the fact that they didn't want to follow, but look at how many others didn't follow. You know the story that Jesus tells about the rich man and Lazarus in the pit of hell. And the rich man says what? Go tell my brother. Go tell my family. Go let them know. You see, the decisions we make always have an impact on those around us. Everything they think they are gaining will one day be lost. And then what will they have left? Paul says, I count it as rubbish. That which is thrown to the dogs. You know, you know, at the end, uh, let me use Jane over here. We're in the, the other day, we go through the kitchen, getting ready for Bible school, and we find out that we've got... Um, coleslaw and potato salad or whatever it was left from the 4th of July thing that we had. I said, man, it's time to throw that out. She said, no, nah, I'm going to take it home and let my chickens eat it. Ooh, I wouldn't eat it when it was good, much less when it was a month old. You know, it's, that, it's rubbish, it's trash, it's waste. Just throw it out. Let the chickens eat it, let the dogs eat it. The King James says it's dung. In other words, it's refuse. It's, it's waste. Uh, you, you, you do know what dung is, right? When your body has done everything it wants to do with the food that it has intake, the rest of it comes out. <laughs> there you go. There's your <laughs> medical lesson for the day. In other words, it's useless. It's worthless. Paul had no more attachment to those things. He was now attached to Jesus Christ. He was now dependent upon Him. Verse 9. And be found in Him having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes from comes through faith in Christ. The righteousness from God that depends on faith. Paul wanted to be found in Christ. He renounced his own righteousness. He he renounced trying to keep the law. What I call that checklist religion. We got to do this. We got to do this. We got to do this. Uh, Paul wanted the righteousness that comes through a faith in Christ. I'm reminded of the Casting Crown song. It says, not because of who I am, but because of what you've done. Not because of what I've done, but because of who you are. We have that relationship because of Jesus Christ. It's not our work, it's His work. It's not because we're anything special, it's because He's something special. 
Here we see a clear picture of the defense of the difference between legalism and grace. We are not trusting in our own righteousness. We're not trusting in something that we can check off. We're not trusting in some kind of list that we have. We're trusting in the righteousness of God. We're trusting in that relationship. I got news for you. You can have a marriage certificate. Legally signed document. But if you don't ever come back home, you don't have a relationship. Amen? And I don't care what your piece of paper says, you're not married. Legally, according to the state you are, according to God you're not. You've abandoned your spouse. Folks, we need the grace, the righteousness of God. And that's Paul's desire as he closes out this particular section. He says that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection. And I may share his, in His sufferings, become like Him in His death. That by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Here we see the plea of Paul's heart. Let me say it in the simplest way possible, and then I'll go back and go a little deeper in it. Paul says, I want Jesus. I want Jesus. Folks, the best decision that you can make today is leave here saying, I want Jesus. Paul says, I, I want to know him. We're not talking about some historical knowledge of some historical figure. We're not talking about just some encounter with Jesus. Now Paul says, I want a personal relationship with him. I want to know him. Most of you know I spent years or earlier, uh, about six years working in the hotel industry, and we were one of the elite hotels. So anybody that was anybody came through there. You know, I, I met Nancy Reagan. I met just about all you little wrestlers that come through. I met congressmen. I met, I mean, I, I met ball players. I met rock stars. I, met, I mean, I met everybody. Do I know him? No. I have an encounter with him. But, but let me call any of them up today and go, Oh yeah, you remember about uh, 20 years ago? <laughs> no, because I don't have a relationship with them. I had an encounter with them. Too many people have had an encounter with Jesus, but they don't have a relationship with Jesus. Paul says, I want to know him. I want to know Him. I want that relationship. He said he wanted to feel the power of His resurrection. Knowing Jesus is knowing power. Amen? You will not know Jesus without knowing the power of Jesus. The new life found in Jesus does not begin with our physical death. It actually begins with our death to self. It begins with us saying, no, I'm not serving self. I'm going to start serving Him. I'm not pleasing self. I'm going to start pleasing Him. And then Paul says, I, I want to share in His suffering. How many of you know are bold enough to make that plea? <laughs> I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm, I'm not really for suffering. Anybody? How many of you find enough suffering without looking for it? <laughs> I'm not signing up. <laughs> but understand, it's part of knowing Jesus. That preacher that, that, that preached to you and said, you get saved and everything's going to be sunshine and roses, listen to me very carefully, look at me. He lied. You don't believe me? Go talk to these people up and down these aisles. He lied. No, Jesus made it clear. He said those that would follow after Him would suffer. Uh, in fact, what Jesus said, if you remember, if you're going to come after Me, He says, take up your cross daily and follow Me. The cross is an instrument of death. I don't know about you, but death doesn't sound real fun to me. What he's saying is every day you've got to die to self and say, I'm going to follow Him. Some of you had to die to self to be here this morning. 
I know some of you that worked Bible school yesterday had to die to self to be here this morning. Because when you woke up, self said, nope. I mean, I rolled over, put my feet on the side of the bed, and like, yeah, my check engine light came on, low oil, all the lights came on for me this morning. <laughs> you said, but preacher, you have to come, you have to preach. You're right, because I tried to get Ralph to do it yesterday. I tried to get Charlie to do it yesterday. I tried. None of them would do it. Ralph said I, I might, that he might surprise me. But guess what? you got to be here too. Because if you're not here, I'm going to look foolish preaching to these empty seats. Now, some of these seats ain't as clean as they should be. They're not as sturdy as they ought to be, but ain't none of them sinned. Paul said, I want to suffer with him. And then Paul says, I want to become like him in death. I don't know all that that entails. But I do know this, Paul would receive his wish, didn't he? If you know the history, Paul would die as a martyr for the cause of Jesus Christ. Paul gave his life preaching the gospel message. All the suffering was worth it, Paul said, considering the reward, the resurrection from the dead. Paul says, everything that has happened here is nothing if I don't get to go there. But because I'm going there, I count everything that has happened here as loss. Because that's the gain. We go back to Paul's zeal, as I mentioned. It was misplaced in the beginning but after his conversion on the road to Damascus, that zeal took on a whole new mission. And Paul said, I want to tell some others about Jesus Christ. Folks, that's how you know when you're on fire for the Lord. Can I tell you, I love when people get saved, truly saved, when they really get it. I love when people come back to the Lord and you see they truly get it. I look and I follow a lot of you on social media. I'm, I'm not going to mention names, don't embarrass anybody, but, but I see some that have really gotten on fire for the Lord, and I love reading what they're doing. Got people out there passing out vacation Bible school pe things to people they don't even know. <laughs> Finding ways to do it that I didn't even think about. Why? <laughs> wow, new fire for the Lord. Because they've begun to see that all that was lost. But serving Christ is gain. We live in a day not so different from the day that Paul saw. Too many people trying to design their own road to heaven. Too many people trying to get people to live up to their standard, up to their self, this, this uh, uh, height that they've established. Folks, let me tell you, there's a very fine line between legalism and loyalty. Jesus is not looking for a bunch of people to keep a bunch of rules. What I call that checklist salvation. Yep, I did that. Yep, I did that. Yep, I did that. Okay, I'm good to go. I don't know about you, but, but I live on my phone now with checklists, especially this past week with VBS. I mean, I had to put a checklist together every single day because if at the end of that day everything wasn't checked off, I didn't think I had been successful that day. That's not the relationship Jesus is looking for. He is looking for some people that will be loyal to Him. And by the way, can I tell you something? If you're loyal to Him, many of those things that the legalists have on their checklist, you're just going to do. Not because you have to check it off, but because that's just what you do in the relationship. You know what? I, I come to church because I love Jesus, not because I can check it off on my spiritual checklist. 
I, I give to the Lord's work because I think there's nothing more worthy to give to than the Lord's work. Not because somebody said I had to give 10% of my income. I, I share the gospel, the good news, not for some sort of reward, but because people need Jesus. So there are things that you we get that relation. There's things we're going to do that would be on both lists, the legalist and the loyal. But we're not serving because of we're doing legalists. We're serving because we're loyal. <coughs> we're serving because what he's done for us. All that stuff that man looks at, that prosperity, that position, that popularity. Folks, we need to see it for what it is. It's just a bunch of waste. Our focus needs to be on attaining righteousness through the faith in Jesus Christ. Everything else will take care of itself. So let me ask you, where do you stand this morning? Why do you serve? First of all, do you serve Him? Do you have a relationship with Him? If you do, let me ask you, why do you serve Him? Why are you here this morning? You afraid you're going to miss something? Is this your weekly social hour? Or did you come to grow closer to Jesus Christ? There's ways you can tell. Why do you serve Him? Do you want a pat on the back? You want people to see everything that you've done? Or you just serve Him because there's service that needs to be done? Anything done for any other reason than to just have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ is waste. We need to do it because we love Him and He loved us. You know, some of you husbands, well, who am I fooling? Some of you wives are going to go home this week and you'll cut your grass. I see the lady shaking her head. I know, see. Got too many women in here cutting grass. That's why we can't get no help at the church. You women have got these men spoiled. Why are you going to do it? Just, you know, because you just love cutting grass, right? No, because the grass needs to be cut. You know, some of you men are going to do, I don't know what you're going to do. You're going to do something, you know, just because it needs to be done. You know, you, you're going to take that ice cream bowl and you're going to put it in the dishwasher. And when you get in the kitchen, you're going to holler, Hey, honey, I put my ice cream bowl in the dishwasher. And she's going to call out the marching band and they're going to play this. Doom, 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 you know. I'm just picking. Now, there's just certain things we do because we're in a relationship together. Amen? Y'all hear me say all the time, happy wife, happy life. Why do we do what we do? We ought to do what we do to build that relationship with Jesus Christ. And that relationship is you and Him. That's it. And everybody in here has to build that relationship. Them and Him. And if we will all focus on that, everything else will come together like it's supposed to come together. We need to surrender to Him and count everything else but waste. Will you do that this morning? Sam's going to come. He's going to play a song of invitation. I surrender all. It's, that's, that's the prayer. That's what I want you to do this morning. Say, God, I want to serve you. Not because I want everybody to see me serve you, but because you're worthy to be served. God, I'm going to love you. Not because I want everybody to see me love you, but because you're worthy to be loved. Will you come? Maybe you're not where you need to be. Today's the day to put things where it needs to be. Wouldn't it be wonderful to leave this place with that relationship exactly where it's supposed to be? Wouldn't it be wonderful to commit today to keep that relationship where it's supposed to be? That's a decision only you can make. That's your personal relationship. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you again for the day that you've given, for the opportunity once again to be in your house. 
Thank you for your word. The challenge that you've placed in there for us. Lord, you're not interested in religion. You're interested in a relationship. And Lord, I ask you to challenge hearts today. Let us see what you see. Let us see the motives behind the things that we do. And if they're not proper, Lord, help us fix them today. Father, help us to commit today to serve you because you're worthy to be served. To love you because you're worthy to be loved be in that relationship with you because it's a worthy relationship not because of what anybody else is going to do or think make it personal today we'll praise you for it in christ's name